Our text today comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 22. Again, that's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 22. And if you found your places, would you rise with me for the reading of God's word? Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 22. Please follow along as I read it out loud. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither drank nor ate. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hand on him so he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confided the Jews that lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. If you would bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, would you just open our eyes to your word, and as we see the blinded Saul, Lord, may we see our own blindness as well, and may you illuminate your text through your Holy Spirit, and show us, Lord, that we are always before you, the audience of one, and so, Lord, even now, Lord, be with us, strengthen us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to see your word as what it is, the word of God. And may we be prostrate before it, humbled always before you. And may you grant us strength and insight into your word. And I thank you for all these things in the strong name of Christ, I pray. Amen. I'm sure many of us have heard the phrase that those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it or something along the lines of history repeats itself. Or if you're like me and a little bit nerdy and like biblical interpretations, you might know the verse, uh, verse 9 of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. What has been is always what will be, and what has been done is always what will be done, and there's nothing new under the earth. Or if you're a hip modern Christian, you simply say there's nothing new under the earth, and you don't realize that's not even the whole verse until someone asks you where it's from, and you have no choice but to Google it. That being besides the point, people really never create anything new. They simply rephrase things or simply alter things to their benefits. And for example, if you look in the ancient church, during the times of persecutions, there existed two kinds of people. Those who ran away or recanted the faith and those who stayed until death or until they were released. At this point, there became a two-tier Christianity that separated those who suffered from those in safety. And so prominence was given to those who suffered and endured. But then what happens when the church is no longer under persecution? What happens when Christianity becomes the dominating religion? How do the Christians differentiate those who are committed from those who are nominal? 
And as outside persecution ceases, internal persecution increases. It was at this point the church moved into a great monastic phase, which meant that if the world would stop persecuting me, I would begin to persecute myself. I would relinquish material gain, the pleasures of this world, and live in an isolated and grueling lifestyle. But then what happens when it's no longer possible to live isolated? When it loses favor with all those who would have to support me because I'm not even working? Well, if the world stops persecuting me and I can't functionally persecute myself, it's time to persecute those around me. As the appeal of self-persecution decreases, it's time for the appeal of persecuting others that increased. And it happened by the exalting of myself. It's time to separate the nominal from those who are committed. And we do it by experientialism. By the experiences or certain gifts that I have and that others don't, I can point and say that if you haven't experienced this, you're not yet saved or maybe not even a mature Christian. And none of these things have really died out, died, died out in the modern church. We still see Christians oppressed by spiritual gifts, or lack thereof, that is. Maybe powerful conversion stories, profound life or spiritual experiences. And none of these things are bad in themselves. For Christ did give gifts to Christians. He called the foulest of criminals, and he surely stood and stands before us. And in fact, it's important to be able to discern who are real Christians and who simply tarnish our Savior's name. But these standards cannot be the answer. So the question is, what is the discerning standard? And as we examine the Apostle Paul's conversion today, actually we should be calling him Saul's conversion today, I hope that we get into an insight of, of what differentiates the committed from the nominal. As a passage is a narrative, it seemed right to me to separate the passage under four scenes. The four headings that, today, that I'll be going over today are aligned with the four scenes. Verses 1 and 2, Saul's preparation. Verses 3 and 9, Saul's confrontation. Verses 10 through 19, which is Saul's restoration. And verses 19 to 22, Saul's proclamation. Again, those were Saul's preparation, his confrontation, his restoration, and his proclamation. And so let's dive into our first scene. Verses 1 to 2, Saul's preparation. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters for the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And like any good narrative, before we can dive into the meat of the text, we need to set the scene. What is happening? And interestingly enough, our passage starts with, but Saul. And because of the conjunction, but, we need to figure out what is the narrator contrasting this particular scene with. And if we look back into our Bibles, only a chapter before in chapter 8, we'll see the heading, Saul ravages the church. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. It's extremely important because here we see the same conjunction, but being used. And this is where the grammar gets interesting. If we're able to see the grammatical relationship between verses 1 and 2 and 2 to 3, we see the meaning behind this specific passage, and we can apply it to the larger context of, our, of chapter 8 and 9. And so what is the relationship of the first three verses in chapter 8? Well, verse 2 has two ands. Saul approved of his execution, him being Stephen, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. It seems to be fair to say that Saul is leading the persecution, and he succeeded in scattering the church in Jerusalem, except for the apostles, that is, that wouldn't be moved. And here we already see a separation from those fleeing and those who remain in the midst of persecution. And what's the outcome? Well, as the apostles stand firm in the midst of persecution that Saul is initiating, they don't go unnoticed, devout men in chapter, verse 2. We have no idea how many there are, but it goes to show that they're amongst the church in Jerusalem, and they followed suit after the apostles. They stood stand fast in the midst of persecution, and it created opportunities for others to be strengthened. So the relationship between verse 1 and 2 is that the apostles and the devout men were standing firm. And here's where the but comes in. In opposition to the resilient, we have the ravager. We, we look to verse 3 and we see just how much hatred is in Saul's heart. He has no care for whether it's men or women. No one was spared. And if you just read the first three verses of chapter 8, you might be tempted to think 
the church is in trouble, or this is possibly the end. But the beautiful thing about this chapter is that not only did the apostles and devout men stand fast to the church in Jerusalem, the scattered church also stead, holds steadfast as well. In case some of you may be thinking in persecution, is the only way to be faithful and remain there. Let me present you the rest of chapter 8, which is in response to Saul's persecution. And it focuses on the fleeing faithful Christians. Philip is the man being focused on in the rest of the chapter, but he wasn't alone. If you look in verse 4, it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Faithful Christians are not bound to a place nor to persecution. They're, they're bound to proclamation. Faithfulness does not require a place, nor even persecution. It involves preaching the gospel. And so for those of us who may wonder whether or not we will remain faithful in the persecution, ask yourself this question. Are you faithfully preaching the gospel here and now, where the situation is calm? Are you carrying on the gospel? But that's only one part of the encouragement found through the conjunction, but we not only see that what we are called to do, we see what Jesus said is true, that on the rock that is the good confession, that he will build his church, and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you see the wonderful encouragement found here? Saul ravages as he might, breeds threats and murder as he will against the disciples of the Lord, but he'll never prevail over the church. Look at all that happened because he started persecuting the church in Jerusalem. The church of Samaria grows. And one Ethiopian eunuch hears the gospel, and where do you suppose he's going to take it? And what's more ironic is that Saul goes to the high priest to ask for letters in order to go persecute the disciples of our great high priest in Damascus. And as you read, you can't help but feel confident Saul is not going to succeed. The more, the more Saul shakes the church, the more the gospel spreads. And I'm thankful that it's springtime because it's actually helpful for this illustration. What happens when the wind blows hard and harder against trees and flowers that are filled with pollen? It covers everything and everywhere. There's not a single person in the city who's not affected by the pollen, whether it covers their homes or their car or affects their allergies. And this is what the gospel is like in the face of persecution. It spreads farther and wider than ever before, and it leaves no person unaffected. And isn't it appropriate that we, when we or when we're spreading the gospel, are like pollen. We're everywhere. We can irritate some, but at the end of the day, we're a part of the process of planning that causes flowers of the gospel to bloom in the hearts of many. And who would have thought that a grammatical <laughs> question in the persecution could be this exciting? I know everyone's dying for more illustrations and more conversations on this topic, but this is only the introduction, and so we'll have to move on. And so to the meat of the text, Oh, before that, let me leave you with one more thing to chew upon, actually. There's one more grammatical relationship that leads us into our next sentence section. If we look back to chapter 8, we saw how Saul in verse 3 is in opposition to the apostles and devout men in verse 1 and 2. To the conjunction but, but now there's an important preposition that gives us a clue into the next text. It's the preposition now. When we look through, the cha when we look through chapter 8, and throughout the book of Acts, we see that when there's something important happening, the preposition now is used. And we'll see it in verse 4, 14, 25, and 26 of chapter 8. And throughout the major points in the narrative of the books of Acts. And now we see that in verse 3 of our text as well. So we have but Saul starting our chapter 9. And now something major is about to happen. And it's about to happen in verse 3. And so we go to our next section, Saul's confrontation. And our next section spans from verses 3 to 9, but because the text is rather long and it will continue to get longer, I won't be rereading them and we'll simply be diving straight in. And so as we introduce the last scene with Saul's breathing threats and murder, and that he had finished preparing himself for the next scene of persecution, we were met with this, strange, this new change in scene in verse 3. As he drew near to Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice. And if you're reading this narrative for the first time, and having just read how Saul proved the innocent Stephen's execution, and how he was throwing men and women into prison, and he's getting ready to do the same to the faithful disciples 
in Damascus? What would you want to happen in this moment? It's so natural that any Christian would want to have Saul be punished here. If they were affected by Saul's persecution, they're expecting divine judgment at this point. But you see, God is not bound by passions nor by the natural, for he's supernatural. So instead of saying, Saul, it's time to be punished, the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And if we take a moment to appreciate the richness of the question, let me quickly point out two amazing things about it. First, we see the double naming, Saul, Saul. And we must recognize that this is a common rhetorical technique that is used to express intense emotion. And where else have we seen it used? Well, if you look at the whole of Scripture, we can think of when God called out Abraham, Abraham in Genesis 22. Or when God commissioned Samuel in 1 Samuel 3.10. Or I'm sure you remember how God called out to the burning, out of the burning bush to Moses in Exodus 3.4. And there's still more that I haven't even named. Yet all these show such an intense emotion in which God directly intervenes. For Abraham, God called out in order to stop him from sacrificing his son. For Samuel, it was God calling out quietly at first. And at the second time, Samuel, and finally the third time, he says, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel finally knew who was talking to him. And for Moses, it was the midst of living an ordinary life where he's called to an extraordinary task. But you see, it's not only common throughout Scripture, but even in the book of Luke's. And this is important because Luke Acts is actually one book with the same author, which I hope you guessed is Luke himself. And so the gospel according to Luke is actually the first part of the book of Acts. And throughout the gospel of Luke, the double naming is used. If you look to Luke 10, 41, Martha, Martha, as Jesus reminds Martha what's important, and that's himself. In Luke 13, 34, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as he laments for the prophet-murdering stick neft city that he deeply cared for. And finally, we see Luke 22, 31, Simon, Simon, as Jesus foretells Simon's betrayal, as Satan demanded to have him, if not for Jesus praying that Peter's faith would not fail. And we see, yes, there are intense emotions involved in the uses of the double naming, but specifically in the book of Luke Acts, we see that it's used when Jesus is troubled by what he sees in someone he deeply cares for. You see, again, that's, the double naming is used in the book of Luke Acts when Jesus is deeply troubled by someone he deeply cares for. And why is Jesus' compassion surpassing our wicked desires? How could he possibly care for someone who deeply hates him and stands in complete opposition to him? It's the same reason that he can possibly care for any one of us. You see, before he called out Saul, Saul, before he called out any one of our names, you know what he called out while we were still enemies of the cross? He cried out, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if Christ did not condemn anyone on the cross, why would he condemn anyone else now? If on the cross he was forsaken so that we can call him upon his name and be forgiven, let us remember that nothing can separate us from his love. No matter how great of a sin you may have committed, whether you find it difficult to even forgive yourself, remember that Christ has already forgiven us and he's covered us from a multitude of sins. And we are his and no one can take that away from us. And it's not even death itself. And this ties into our second point. Notice Saul at this moment doesn't even know who he's talking to as he replies in verse 5, Who are you, Lord? That before mentioning his own glorious name, he shows his compassion for Saul, and then he shows his compassion for his church. Notice in verse 4, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my church or my people or even my disciples? He says, me. And here, may we recognize that to be a part of the church is to be a part of Christ. That Christ intimately identifies himself with the church and their pains. It's not a pain outside of him, but it's intimately tied with him. So to assault the church is to assault Christ himself. And therefore, may we have confidence through every trial and every heartache that, we, that though we are weak, though sin seems to be reigning in our lives, though we may fail time and time again that we have a shepherd, and that he will defend us, and that it really is true, the night has been won, that we have overcome, 
it's not I, but it's Christ in me. Our sufferings are Christ's sufferings. And he's there as the great high priest to comfort us. But at the same time, his victories are our victories. And so may we never lose heart. For Christ has overcome the grave. What is there left that can overcome us? If death itself has been swallowed up in victory, if the infinite chasm that separated us from God has been fully bridged on the cross and in the resurrection, what can possibly stand before us now? What can separate us here and now? So let us wait faithfully, confident in the hope that is Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, as we see how the rest of the scene wraps up, we see, that Saul, not, we see that Saul's only reply to Jesus' question is, Who are you, Lord? And though it would be wonderful to say that in this moment that Saul recognized that Jesus is God himself, and though we do know, Saul here doesn't know yet that he's talking to Jesus specifically. So Saul's reference to Lord seems more of a respectful manner towards a being far greater than himself. And so, fall, so Saul fully aware who he is persecuting by persecuting disciples, Jesus immediately instructs Saul what to do. He says, get up and go. And verse 8 through 9, Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And our scene ends with Saul resuming his mission into Damascus. But this time, he's able to see for the first time, and he's blind. Yet in his blindness, Saul is able to see truly how helpless he is. And not only that, he's able to see how blind he really was. The great and mighty Saul, who stated in Galatians 1.14 about himself, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. And mind you, this is the new creation Paul talking. It's the humble and meek Paul. So when he said he was advancing, we can probably assume he was excelling beyond. He was surpassing everyone. And it's this Saul that finally gets to see for the first time just how little he really knew. And can you imagine what those three days are like for Saul? How much he would have finally been able to connect the dots and see where all his knowledge was finally pointing towards. And imagine when he wrote the words of Romans 11.36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. How powerful those words weighed for the Apostle Paul, who was able to see so clearly that his knowledge and being had found its fullness in Christ. And here our scene shifts as the mighty persecutor Saul enters the city of Damascus as the repentant prisoner Saul. So we move on to our next scene, verses 10 through 19, which is Saul's restoration. And the first character that sets our stage is Ananias, a disciple in Damascus. Ironically enough, Ananias could have easily been Saul's first victim. If we look forward in the book of Acts, specifically in chapter 22, verse 12, Paul mentions in a later recount of his testimony, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. Ananias, a well-known disciple amongst the Jews, would have been the perfect target for the persecuting Saul. But fortunately, that's not how our story unfolds. And so the Lord appears to Ananias in a vision and tells him to seek the praying Saul, who also received the vision of Ananias laying his hands on him and healing his eyes. And all seems to be going well. Oh well, we get Ananias' protest. If we look to verse 13 to 14, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Saul's, infinite, uh, Saul's bad reputation precedes him, that even his actions of going to the high priest is known to those who are so far in Damascus. And when we look at it objectively, Ananias is right. There's absolutely no reason to trust someone as murderous as Paul as Saul, that is. In fact, for the disciples in Damascus, as well as any other disciple of the Lord, this was the opportune moment to get rid of their greatest enemy. And how often does the chance come that the greatest persecutor of the church will become blind and helpless? 
And if we're honest, how many of us wouldn't respond like Ananias? But again, isn't it amazing that God's ways are higher and grander than our own? If I could borrow the words of the Apostle Paul himself as he wrote, as he wrote in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. You can almost imagine what the Apostle Paul was thinking as he wrote these words, as he remembered that he too was living in his own self-induced disobedience until the mercy of God was made revealed to him and his heart couldn't remain silent any longer. And as we remember our own sin-drenched lives before we met Christ, how can our hearts possibly remain silent as well? And to just what were we called to when we met Christ? If we look to the Lord's reply to Ananias, it's actually incredible how God both encourages Ananias and reveals to what great length Saul is called to go. Ananias' great concern lies in verse 14. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He fears the authority Saul has, which he not only received from the chief priest, but allows him to bind those who call on the name of the Lord. But the Lord, look how he replies in verse 15. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. It's as if the Lord is saying, you think Saul's authority from the chief priest can bind those who call upon my name? I have given him greater authority as my chosen instrument to carry my name, not only to those who call upon my name, but even those who will call upon my name. And he thought Saul's zealousness was fearsome on the enemy's side. Wait till you see him on God's side. And it doesn't end there. Verse 16. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. The one who would have binded those who call upon the name of the Lord to suffering but will be the very one who will suffer for the Lord's name's sake. It's an amazing twist of events and a play of words. And though these words are specific to Saul's calling, I don't think they're completely inapplicable to us as well. We are his chosen instruments because we are carrying his names. We're Christians. And as long as we bear that name, we'll carry it to the ends of the earth. And for some of us, that's going back to our hometowns after graduating. For others, it may be going to any part of this country or even beyond to what literally feels like the ends of the earth. But for all of us, we carry his name right here and now in Philadelphia. And for all extensive purposes, some of us, some of our ends of the earth, at least for the next few years, might never pass outside of the state of Pennsylvania. And so regardless of where you fall in these categories, the question is, how will you bear his name? We are Christians, and especially in the modern church, we have to learn a theology of suffering. We have to see how our relationship with Christ does not eliminate all the sins and miseries in our lives. To bear the name of Christ is really to carry our cross. It means not everything will go right. It means we may constantly struggle with particular sins in our lives. It might be that we may go through long periods of suffering, but it also means that we have a great Savior who is sovereignly reigning at this very moment in our lives. And not only do we have a great Savior, we have a new family that will walk alongside us in our great difficulties. And as we are blinded by great things in our lives and desperately praying out to God, it just might be a fellow brother or sister of God will use God will use a fellow brother or sister to help restore your sight back to Christ. And so we see verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And don't miss the significance of what Ananias is saying. Not too long ago, Ananias wanted to have no part with the persecuting Saul. But here we see him restoring Saul to what he truly is, a brother. And some have taken passages such as this to be a sign of miraculous healing so that we should go lay our hands upon others as if we're healers ourselves. But if we look at the account carefully, the focal point is not the healing of Saul, but it's his inauguration. Ananias is here to lay hands on Saul in order to both commission him and to bring him restored into the brotherhood. And in verse 18 to 19, 
We see a complete reversal of everything that had befallen upon Saul. His sight is restored. He was baptized into the family of God. He takes up food. He's strengthened once more. And so as our scene of Saul's restoration comes to a close, it's time to go to our closing scene, verses 19 to 22, which is Saul's proclamation. And in our final scene, we see that only in a matter of days of being with the disciples of Damascus, Saul already goes out proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. And the shock factor here is incredible. Even the listeners of Saul feel the same way. If you look to verse 21, And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for the purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? And even for us who walk through an overview of Saul's conversion, until this verse, you can't help but feel sense of awe. What could transform a man so that he goes, from, he goes from going to a city to persecute it and he ends up preaching to it? I mean, just a few days ago, he hadn't even known who Jesus was and he hadn't even known who he was talking to on that road to Damascus. But this shows us at the same time that the gospel is so simple. It takes no time at all. It takes so little to fully understand. But as we all know and fully trust in it, we know that to fully trust in it takes a lifetime. The gospel is simple that anyone may hear and believe. For many of us in this room who can simply recite the gospel that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, we struggle daily to believe it. Some of us have forgotten or have chosen to forget what we are desperately in need of saving from. Others among us are so lost in their sin that they feel like they're too far gone from being saved or have fallen so far away to be restored. And even though, and there are even those among us who have yet to even believe in the gospel and believe that it is good news to you. And no matter where you fall along in these groups, do you know who it was that said that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost? It was Saul. And I'm confident that when he said these words, there wasn't an ounce of doubt and that he believed every single word of it. Have you had a broken and marred past? Yeah, so did the apostle Paul. Do you come from a broken family? You see, Saul persecuted and imprisoned many of his own. And have you committed murder? Saul killed an innocent man, and he was ready to kill even more. And even still, do you know where Saul's confidence comes from? Well, let's look to 1 Corinthians 15 that was just preached last week. And if we look closely, verse 1 through 10 are actually Saul's autobiography about our passage this morning. Look to verse 8 to 9. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And he could have ended it there. And he could have pointed to why he desperately trusted in the resurrection. But Saul doesn't stop. And he continues on to verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And so what is the one standard that differentiates those who are committed Christians and those who are nominal Christians? It's the grace of God. Or if you put it another way, there's nothing because there can be no true nominal Christian unless we are saying his grace was in vain. For it is the grace of God that I am what I am, that I'm a Christian at all. And it's the grace of God that I can so exemplify Christ. And when we're, with, when we're in Christ, it's not a matter of who we are or what we did, but a matter of who Christ is and what he's already accomplished under Christ. Christ is what makes a true Christian. But when Christ makes us his own, we can't help, because of the grace that is within us, to strive after him, proclaim his name, and to bear our crosses as his, and his wonderful name, that is. And just like Saul in verse 22, we will continue to grow in strength and confound those around us by proving that Jesus is the Christ. And the question is, what is our strength? What are we growing in? Well, it certainly isn't talking about Saul's physical strength. 
And if we look to what Saul says in 2 Corinthians 10 to th- chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The strength we grow in is in the Spirit. It's a term from being people that are bound to so many things in the world. And just as Saul, while looking to bind any belonging to the way, was himself bound not only to the way, but to also to the truth and the life, may we too, having, being, having been found and bound to him, who is the way, the truth, and the life, may we not, be, may we not only be freed from the things of this world, but may we take every thought captive to obey Christ both to the world around us and especially our own. And with this in mind, may we go forth from here, living and remembering our own conversion and remembering the resurrection of Christ, that every Sunday that we truly see that he has risen and throughout the weeks to come, we're able to have confidence in our hope that is Christ. Let's pray. At this time, can we just spend a few minutes just reflecting upon what we just heard? And as we reflect upon the conversion of Saul, may we reflect upon our own conversion. May we reflect upon how we stumbled into the way and we too found truth in life. And so as we see this, as we see that our confidence is in the grace of God alone and not what we did, but that we truly were at his mercies every step of the way, may we reflect and may we just have joy and confidence in his name.